to get to the root of that one, you've got dopamine carrying a conditional stimulus signal. Mm -hmm. Opioids reward that conditional stimulus signal. They're both impinging on oxytocin. One's driving oxytocin release. The opioids actually drive at a molecular level the creation of what's called a CD38 gene. Mm -hmm. That gene is critical. It's a, essentially a calcium channel uh, uh, activator. And that gene allows calcium to come in, which then produces more oxytocin release. So the dopamine signal is triggering the oxytocin neuron to release however the hell much it has. Yeah. The opioid signal has sensitized this mechanism, right, that now allows more oxytocin release. So when you're in the presence of the partner, there's more oxytocin release. Hello, this is Tyler Gleckler, and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today is a bit of a special episode, as this is the first time I've been fortunate enough to record the podcast with a guest in person, and in Prague nonetheless. While today's guest and topic are both fascinating, there is more to be desired in terms of the production. So I apologize for a less than ideal audio and video configuration. I have many plans for improvement moving forward, and hope that it won't detract from the conversation today. So, with that out of the way, today I'm speaking with Dr. Jim Faust, Professor of Neuroscience at Charles University in Prague and the Research Director of the Center for Sexual Health and Intervention at the Czech National Institute of Mental Health. Jim's research focuses on the neurobiology, neurochemistry, and molecular biology of sexual behavior and examines how the brain's neurochemical and neuroanatomical systems are organized for sexual arousal, desire, pleasure, and inhibition. Over Jim's more than 30 years as a professor, he has received countless awards for his work as both a research scientist and scientific communicator, and his work has been reported worldwide in popular media, including Time, Scientific American, the BBC, and many more. I had the chance to speak with Jim about a variety of topics at the center of his research and found the research area to be endlessly fascinating. This conversation differs from many of my previous in a number of ways, and I encourage anyone viewing to keep an open mind. We touch on everything from the scientific to the obscene and everything in between. Human sexuality is at the heart of the human condition and defines and dictates much of our culture and society. While often relegated to a lower position on the academic totem pole, sexual behavior and the underlying neuroscience is every bit of a rigorous and valuable scientific topic as is any other, and Jim does a fantastic job at communicating cutting edge research while being casual and humorous all the while. It was a privilege and a pleasure to get the chance to speak with him and without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jim Faust. If you could just introduce yourself and give some context for why we're having this conversation, that would be great. So I'm Jim Faust. I'm a professor of neuroscience at Charles University in Prague. I'm also a research director of the Center for Sexual Health and Intervention at the Czech National Institute of Mental Health. Um, I do rat research mostly on uh, sexual behavior, understanding kind of the neuroscience of sex, understanding how the brain is organized for sex for both excitation and inhibition. Um, yeah, so yeah. we're here, I think, to discuss that. Yeah, of course. One of the things, you know, I, what I like to do before every, every conversation is sort of speak with friends and kind of just get their opinion on like, Sometimes they'll say, well, why are you taking an interest in that topic? Mm -hmm. Or sometimes they immediately have questions that they sort of put forth to me to ask. And one thing that I was met with is sort of what's the motive, the fundamental motivation for the research? Like, What's the goal? Is it mostly for the development of neuropharmaceuticals? Is it the development for, like, what, what is sort of the end goal of your research? Well, <clears throat> every time I think there's an end goal, there's a new end goal. So entropy is not dead. <laughs> um, I think... I, I don't think there is an end goal other than discovering how the brain is really, well, how does it participate in sex? Mm -hmm. um, does it utilize the same neurochemical systems and the same neuroanatomical systems as other primary drives? But then is sex really a primary drive? You don't die from not having sex. So what, you know, in fact, you may die if you have yeah. sex. So the question then is, well, how does it utilize the same systems that we might see in things like hunger, thirst, and even drug addiction and electrical mm -hmm. brain stimulation? Mm -hmm. How does it utilize those to maximize your sexual output? And, you know, one of the things that's always struck me is that every question I asked was like, you know, I end up getting at least 
<laughs> 10 to 15 more to ask. And you'd think that a lot of, a lot of things in sexual behavior are hardwired, mm -hmm. right? Which means that they should all be for a reproductive endpoint. But yet we find that all of those endpoints come under the influence of learning. Mm -hmm. So what's you know what's instinctual, and what's learned, and is that even the right question, or is the question well, is it instinctual to learn, mm -hmm. right? That there's nothing really, you know, about your sexual behavior, that's absolutely instinctual, including the physiological mechanisms of. You know, things like ejaculation and orgasm, they're not necessarily instinctual. You've got to experience them. And getting to that point requires experience of behaving sexually, of getting genital stimulation, of getting st other types of stimulation. So you can activate these processes in your brain that allow you then, you know, as an adult, to just, you know, anticipate it. Oh, well, you know, I... I it's, you know, it's taken for granted that when I do this, I'm going to, you know, that's going to be one of my endpoints is to have an orgasm. Well, when you first have your first orgasm, that's not an endpoint that you even understand. And probably nobody's told you, right, at that point when you're, you know, whatever, 11, 12, masturbating for the first time. You know, well, this is going to come to fruition as an orgasm and you're going to actually ejaculate if you're male or you're going to have these, you know, this feeling of release. Well, as a female or as a male, well, no, who tells you that? You know, your parents say, well, now, son, <laughs> you're getting to the point in your life where this is going to happen, so let me give you some pointers. It's like, no. I mean, you do this by yourself, and quite often you learn about how that works, and you learn what kind of sensory experience you need to make that happen. So what's happening in your brain when that's happening? What, what, you know, what solidifies, what crystallizes to make that happen? And then at the same time, what are you thinking about when that happens? Mm -hmm. How do you generate the arousal for that to happen? Is it always from porn? Has it always been from porn? I mean, porn's as old as our species, but has it always been viewing something? What if you're blind? Yeah. You know, yeah. What's, what's porn to a, to a blind person? What's porn to a deaf person? You know, so how do, you, how do we amalgamate all of that into this kind of conscious awareness of you know, our sexual interests, our sexual arousal, putting it together to actually have sex and have sex in a way that makes you feel good but also makes the partner feel good. So how does that all work? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when I first started getting into this, there was no information on that. Really? So this I is mean, all quite new. Decades actually, old. actually, my first orgasm, I mean, if you want to put it that <laughs> way, sure. I mean, that was one of the big drivers of this because my body had never done that before. And I was trying to figure out what, what happened to me. Like, mm -hmm. what was that? Yeah. Right? I know that kind of sounds kind of weird, but... I feel like that's a pretty natural question to ask. You just well, took it that step further and stuff. It was it. a big driver. I mean, yeah, I was young, but it's like, what the hell was that? And there was no information. I mean, I was able to, you know, get a copy of Masters and Johnson, their 1966 book. And all they talked about was the release of sexual tension. I was like, what? It doesn't really, what, not very descriptive. What is that? Yeah. You know, you're telling me that there's an EPOR model of sexual response with the O being orgasm, releasing sexual tension, and then producing this refractory period. Well, yeah, okay, so I can't get it up again. What is that? Like, what's going on? What, what's happening with, with that? Mm -hmm. You know, and do I understand it from their understanding of it? No, I didn't understand anything from their understanding of it. And I really became convinced as an undergrad, you know, in the early 1980s, that this has to be in the brain. Mm -hmm. And in the body, of course, in the spinal cord, but it has to be, there have to be, like, real, honest-to-God neurochemical processes doing this. And when you see it, you, know, you see male rats ejaculate and then fall asleep for five minutes, you're like, well, okay, that looks similar. Yeah. I can kind of see the, Relate to the that homology of that. Mm -hmm. So so is something going on in their brains that would be going on in our brains? And can I understand what's happening in us from looking at them? Mm -hmm. And that really is kind of how the trajectory began. So, as late as the 80s? Because it seems to me somewhat intuitive, but maybe that's just because we have known this for a handful of decades now, that it is fundamentally neurochemical, neurobiological. There was a point where we didn't think it was sort of fundamentally in the brain? Oh, well, I think people knew or but sort of just suspected no, that it was, but they also suspected that, it, you know, that there were processes that were happening, 
you know, urogenitally, there are processes happening in the spinal cord, the processes may be happening in the brain as well, to interpret the experience, but nobody ever talked about it. Like, you know, you can think of, when we think of cognition, what do we think of? We think of, well, kind of a conscious awareness of a process that allows us to have some kind of intellectual capacity. So if I can compute something, if I can, you know, engineer something and understand the geometry of that or the or the trigonometry of that, that's a cognitive thing happening in my brain that is, you know, at the conscious level allowing me to make a prediction, right? If I'm a quarterback and I'm throwing the football, I have to make a prediction that, you know, if the wide receiver is going to mm -hmm. catch it 50 yards down, I have to throw it in such a way that it's not going to weigh the hell over that person's head or fall short and be intercepted. If I'm, you know, a hockey player, I've got to whack it in such a way and deke out the goalie in such a way that when I, you know, hit the puck, it's going to go in, right? And when you think about that, you think about, well, okay, there's a big dumb jocks who, you know, clearly couldn't think their way out of a paper bag. Oh, yeah, except for the fact that most people can't throw a football yeah. or hit a puck that's actually going to go in the corner of the of the goal. Mm -hmm. So they have to their their conscious and subconscious awareness of what they're doing has to be so fine-tuned and owned as athletes that they're able to do that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Where's our knowledge of that for sex? Like people tend to think, oh sex is really basic. You don't really think about it. Really? Really? Yeah, if you're preparing you're for your date Friday night, you're definitely thinking about it. Neurotically thinking about it. You're thinking about it, it. You're thinking about it neurotically, <laughs> yeah. exactly, right? So where does that come from? You know, and how do we divide that? How do we understand that? What are the heuristics that allow us to understand like appetitive versus consummatory motivation of, for sex and what's going online when that happens? Like how are you, you know, what are you thinking about and why are you thinking about it? Why do you obsess over it? Mm -hmm. Why do you obsess over every little hair that has to be just perfectly yeah. placed in the mirror when you run into the bathroom so that your date won't think you look bad? It's like, what's going on there, mm -hmm. right? How does that work? And that was really my driving motivation when I went to grad school was to understand that. So to what extent do we think there is an intuitive aspect of sex? Because I imagine to some, I mean... There's some element of it that you are, I don't know if to say born with is the best way to put it, but, you know, human beings, as, soon as, they, as early as Homo sapiens came into existence, sure. they, they had some idea of what was going mm -hmm. on, a different conception, and I'm sure the details were different, but there is an intuitive component. So mm -hmm. have they studied, I imagine cross-cultural is one way to sort of probe this, going to indigenous peoples across the world mm -hmm. and see how they conceptualize it? Yeah, well, certain things are obviously quote-unquote intuitive and instinctual, right? The mechanisms of clitoral erection, of penile yeah. erection are identical, um, and they're identical for different people, they're identical for different species, uh, basically they're identical in all mammals, right? So you can't, you know, all females have a clitoris, mm -hmm. all males have a penis, and when you differentiate the male, the clit becomes your penis. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's the same hemodynamics, so in that respect, it's the same, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, I, I would imagine that going back in time or even, you know, going to Stone Age tribes that still exist, you would, you would find some awareness, if you could talk to them yeah. about their sex, you'd find some awareness of their sexual procedures, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, so if you want to make a baby, you don't like, <laughs> I don't know, you don't give a blowjob, you actually yeah. go for, you know, penile vaginal intercourse. Yeah don't want to make a baby, then you don't go for penile vaginal intercourse. Okay? They probably know that, yeah. right? And yeah. it's probably been handed down, right? Um, but the process under which that works, they may not know, right? They may not know what ovulation yeah. is, or they may know that at ovulation, women are hornier, yeah. right? They may understand that, mm -hmm. but they, I mean, if, I'm sure if I went to a Stone Age tribe and said, well, you know, what's actually happening on the, on the morning yeah. of ovulation <laughs> yeah. is, she, her ovaries are giving out testosterone, mm -hmm. which of course is what masculinized you, except for the fact that your masculinization in your brain converted that testosterone into estradiol, and that's what actually did it. You know, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be sure. confusing people dramatically, and I'm sure, sure they would just say, well, okay, so what? Like, we know that happens, and she dances better, and I'm more attracted to the way she dances. So, you know, the epiphenomenon of that, mm -hmm. the conscious awareness of that, is that 
yeah, she feels hornier and you feel hornier. Mm -hmm. And then you get together and you yeah. do your little dance of synergy yeah. and it becomes beautiful, right? And so we can think of it at many different levels of analysis like that. You can think of it from the romantic and cognitive and emotional level. And that's a true understanding. And maybe it's even coincident with a feeling like a release of tension. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because being horny... With all dressed up with nowhere to go is not exactly the most fun you can have, no, sure. right? You <laughs> yeah. want to be able to release that horniness yeah. and yeah. you know and have the tension build until the kiss comes, sure. and yeah. until you f do that first thing, and then you know and then what? Then do you move too quick? Do you move not quick enough? Like what do you do? How do you read that other person's body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the mind behind it, or at least yeah. the motivation behind that, right? You got to learn how to do that. That's not in, that's not instinctual. Yeah. So you may want to go for the kill, yeah, and that other person isn't ready for you to go for the kill, yeah. and so the, then you're backing the person in a corner, saying no, no, yeah. no, yeah. and if you don't respect that, now you're f moving that thin line over to rape. Yeah. So how do you navigate that? Mm. But I'm horny. Well, yeah. I'm going to get toxic sperm buildup and my penis is going to explode. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You'll you be fine. You <laughs> might be able to use that once in high school, but you're not going to use that anytime after that. So how do you get to that point and how do you know about that? Right? And experience is the best. It's the only teacher. Right? Yeah. Somebody yeah. come along and say, oh, you know, what, what do you say to a girl to get her in bed? What do you say to a guy to get her in bed? Well, okay, we have ways of doing that and they're cultural but they're also epic generated yeah. i mean nobody says oh come here often <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> like they did back in the late 70s so it's like you know things are different and they're different each in each generation mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so that navigation requires a lot of learning and how learning works then for sex is something a lot of people don't like because they don't they like to think that sex is somehow your sexual behavior is some of this immutable thing that you just do. You just do it, right? Mm -hmm. but even animals make mistakes. Yeah. You know, so you got a dog trying to fuck a chicken. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, why would a dog do that? Mm -hmm. Well, they're animals. They should know better. Or they should know less than we know. But does that mean they actually know more than we know? No. Their fetishes exist in all of these species. And you can generate that, right? Yeah. Even in a laboratory setting. Yeah. And somewhat related, one of the fundamental reasons I wanted to have this conversation is, again, there's sort of almost an epidemic, of, especially with men, the, the way the dynamic has sort of changed, I mean, in cell culture, let's say, and a lot of the, if you're familiar with Andrew Tate and, mm -hmm. and the people, this sort of, I don't even know how to articulate it, I've thought about it a lot, but this strange phenomenon where it seems like more and more men have lost the ability completely to go through that process of trial and error and have the experiences to become sexually healthy in a behavioral sense. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestions as to what's <laughs> going on really? Like why is there such a change in that dynamic? Oh, that's a, I mean, that's a huge... Yeah, of course, of course. It's a huge question. And it's riding on the coattails of just like other things that are happening in culture, in yeah, Western culture sure. today, which is, you know, entitlement and, yeah. you know, this should come to me just because I exist. You know, I should get a gold star just for participating. Um, and I'm not, I'm not singling out millennials in this because I think incels mm -hmm. have existed sure. since the beginning of it's time. Right? Portion, though. I am special. Mommy told me I was special, mm -hmm. and so I am special, and people should just want me because I breathe. Mm -hmm. Well, no. No, mm -hmm. and somebody didn't do their job to yeah. show you what to do or tell you what to do or take you under their wing and say, you know, you want this, you got to do this, yeah. and you got to toughen up, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just even with incels. You also have this in, in Japan now where, yeah. where these, you know, like 20 to 30-year-olds are having sex in a way that might be equivalent to that of people that are self-describing themselves in North America as asexuals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then they're not asexual in the sense of they don't have sex. I mean, some are, clearly. Sure. But mostly they're having sex, but they're masturbating. Mm -hmm. And if they have sex with another person, it's not in person, but it's done over Zoom, yeah. right? So they're having like some kind of virtual sex with another person. Mm -hmm. um, now, virtual sex is easy. Masturbation is easy, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, I mean, I would hope. Um, 
Woody Allen once said, it's having sex with somebody you care deeply about. Mm. But you're, it's easy because you're not navigating anything or negotiating anything with another partner. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe you're doing that if you're having Zoom sex, but you know, that can be as easy as swiping right or left on Tinder or Grindr, right? Mm-hmm. So you can, you know, there's a way to do that that makes, you know, all that, those social skills that people do need to have when they're having sex with another real person, yeah. right? Just, it, it obviates against it. You don't need that anymore. You can just swipe right. Okay, here, off I go. Yeah? Or, and, you know, you're having Zoom sex with somebody that you've negotiated that with over the, you know, over cyberspace. And mm-hmm. it's like, okay, well, now we're just going to take our clothes off and have sex. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. The social skills don't develop. And that is going to reinforce doing it over cyberspace. Mm-hmm. Or reinforce being an incel, feeling that you deserve to have Barbie, but only Ken has Barbie. Yeah. So, you know, you can't have Barbie because you're not good enough, but you are because you own this car yeah. and you've got this flashy, you know, flashy clothes and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they need, you know, they're sort of one level away from the person who doesn't have the social skills to do it. Yeah? Yeah. And you say, well, I don't need social skills. I got a, I got a nice car. But no. You need the social skills. In fact, you could have a VW Beetle, okay, mm-hmm. which kind of looks like a clitoris. You have a VW <laughs> Beetle, and more people are going to look at your Beetle than are going to look at your little, you know, your cock car that yeah. looks very phallic. Well, mm-hmm. why is that? You know, what's mm-hmm. cute about, you know, and being cute, oh, well, that's not masculine. You know, then you got this whole other thing about what is it to be masculine or feminine, and these definitions change. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have the social skills to deal with that change, right? Yeah. Then the cognitive capacity just says, well, I don't need it. I shouldn't need it. Mommy told me I was good enough. So why am I not good enough? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm entitled to be good enough. Well, no, you're yeah. not. Yeah. You know, you're entitled to eat. Yeah. But it's about it. <laughs> you're like, you're entitled to breathe. You're entitled to eat. Yeah. But you also have to be in a place where your control over that is in your hands, mm-hmm. right? So what, do these guys live at home? Well, a lot of them do, right? Is mommy still making their dinner for them? Yeah, mommy's still making it. Mommy hasn't yeah. let you leave, mm-hmm. right? So the problem is not just the incel. The problem is the support system of the incel, mm-hmm. which is still someone who is letting this person be a baby. Mm-hmm. Letting this person be a young boy and not allowing this person to grow up, right, and have social skills. That's not good parenting. Yeah. Right? So that, and that gives rise to this whole nanny state idea that you have to be in control of everybody and, you know, nobody's allowed to do anything on their own. Sure. Um, you know, and, and everybody deserves a gold star for just participating. Sure. Which... The true uh, pandemic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really bad thing. Yeah. Right? So on that basis, I assume I, we should expect it to get worse then because the dating apps are becoming more prolific. They're becoming relevant at an earlier age. There's more of a variety of them. They're getting yeah. better in some sense, I mean, as far as their, their goals. And in terms of the parenting and, and all of that, I don't see that getting better either. So are you sort of, a, would you say you're against these apps? Do you see them as a detriment? I'm not really against them, but I'm not really for them either. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like okay, I mean... You know, when when you think of think of synergy and how that works between people, mm-hmm. I mean, to get people together, you got to go from distal to proximal to interactive, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And throughout that process, as a person recognizing somebody flirting with you from a distance or being attracted to somebody at a distance, okay, you look at that. That's activating neurochemical systems in your brain that make you want to get closer to that individual, like mesolimbic dopamine, for example. So you want to get closer to that person. So you got to do something to get closer to that person. Mm-hmm. Okay, if it's at a party, you got to navigate your way through people to go to that person. Now you got to. So now you've gone from distal to proximal. Mm-hmm. Now you got to go interactive. You got to say something. Mm-hmm. What do I say? You know, yeah. like you think of like your high school dance or something. You know, it's like were you the wallflower on the wall, yeah. like not knowing what to say and feeling really awkward and kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. self-directed and inward, or did you know were you the gregarious person who just go and say, hey, you want to dance? Mm-hmm. Oh. What if the person says no? Mm-hmm. I couldn't take that kind of rejection. Okay, I feel like, you know, McFly's dad. Sure, you know, sure. I, I couldn't take that kind of rejection. Mm-hmm. But you, you do it once, 
And if the person says no or laughs at you, now what, do you then murder them or do you, yeah. or do you just go on to the next yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? I mean, if you ask, you know, you ask a hundred people to dance with you, even chance alone yeah. at 0 0.05 says that five out of the hundred yeah. are going to say yes. Exactly. Okay. And if you think in a Bayesian way, well, that's like a, you know, that's like that's right. a, a billion times better than all the rest of them that said no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our brain is, our, our brain thinks that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can even do like Albert Bandura used to have people who, who can't, you know, date because they can't meet people because it's just, it's too much, right? He would have them go out as part of his, like, what he called rational emotive psychotherapy, would be to go out and ask a hundred women, right? It was usually men. Sure. Ask a hundred women not to go out with you or go to coffee with you, if they will have sex with you, mm. okay? Now, different time, sure. different place, sure. right? Sure. And men would go out and after, the, you know, God, they come back like the next week, that's all they had to do was just that, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some women would slap them over across the face. Yeah. But, oh my God, after 19, one said yes. Oh, wow. One out of 20, yeah. which is also 0.05. Yeah, yeah, yeah? yeah. So it's like, it's like, chance alone, one woman was like, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go sleep with you. Sure. Right? <coughs> These guys would come back and go, oh my God. I right? just had to ask the whole time. I, I just, had all to I had to do was ask, and not even ask if they go out with me, but ask, you know, I did the the worst thing I could possibly think of doing, mm -hmm. asking if they'll sleep with me. And this one said yes, like a revelation, right? Mm -hmm. And so now they are not afraid to go and ask somebody if they'll have coffee because that's like, way that's easier. like nothing. That's yeah. way easier yeah. than asking them if they'll go you know, to bed with them. So it's like, okay. So they learn. Mm -hmm. Their brain learns. And whatever's inhibiting them, the system that says, well, I might get rejected, and the fear of that rejection, the overriding of kind of their excitatory system by inhibition says, no, I shouldn't do that, I can't do that, I'm not good enough to do that, I'm not this, whatever. Mm -hmm. Those systems now are learning that they don't, they don't need to do that. They don't yeah. need to listen to that little person in the back of their head that keeps on telling them they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's driven by real neurochemical processes. You know, you mm -hmm. think of your frontal lobe, frontal lobe function is executive function, it's behavioral inhibition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need it when you're playing the piano, you know, yeah. you're not banging like yeah. a baby, right? But too much of it really gets in the way of your ability to just be spontaneous, Yeah. right? And that spontaneity is driven by dopamine, mm -hmm. among other, many other neurochemicals, but that's a prime driver of spontaneity. Now, you don't want so much spontaneity that you're just go like, you know, oh, we're in the middle of this interview, but ah, I think I'm going to just go leave. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's ridiculous. The balance right? of control. You need a balance of that control and spontaneity. Mm -hmm. and the, but you don't want to balance it so... You, you, don't want to, you don't want to go in inhibitory so much that you can't be spontaneous when you need to be. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be so spontaneous that you're going to like run in front of a, of a bus and get hit. Mm -hmm. yeah? So you need to balance that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what's one of the things we learn to do in our lives in mm -hmm. general, but it's something that we need to learn how to do sexually, mm -hmm. right? Because either one can become a problem. Yeah. 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 Well, it seems to me if it is, you know, fundamentally sort of rooted in neurochemistry, how important is it to have this sort of, again, the neurochemical practice at certain key points in your development? It's critical. Because it seems to be there are, there, yeah, there's got to be periods where if you don't get that type of yeah. practice in spontaneity, yeah. I mean, it's not like you're screwed for life or something like that, but I've got to imagine it's, you know, meaningfully more difficult to make up for it later on. Yeah. And that's where, you know, your brain is an experience-dependent organ, okay? And what you become used to mm -hmm. is the way you think the world works, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a woman who's been used to not having any pleasure with sex, that's how the world works, mm -hmm. right? And you may never have had an orgasm, you may um, think that sex is something you trade for something else. You know, if he wants a blowjob, I get earrings. Okay, mm -hmm. well, okay. Well, that's that's the dynamic that you now have with your relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when you have that pleasure, and it's you realize it's in your control, 
Um, or, or, you know, you have a relationship, I know what an orgasm is, you know, I've, I always have the same one every time, or the same ones every time, and now you're in a new relationship, and all of a sudden it's different. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my God, like, what, what have I been missing? Yeah. You know, and what are the dynamics around that? And one thing female, the female rats have told us is that they really like, when they really like sex, it's because they get to control the initiation and the rate mm. of the stimulation that they receive. When that's under their control, they love sex, love it. When it's not under their control, they really don't, mm. right? Now, control issues are the biggest problem in heterosexual relationships, actually even in homosexual relationships. Mm -hmm. Not so much to men because they can kind of do it for, but it's, it's, it's a huge problem when one person wants something the other person doesn't. How do you navigate that? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it's, or one person wants it, they initiate it, but then the other person takes over. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's, there's nothing sexually speaking when you're like trying to go for an orgasm, if you're a woman and the dude thinks it's a, you know, it's an Olympic sport mm -hmm. and you have to change positions every two minutes yeah. it's like oh and she's like really close yeah. and he's like oh now I want you on top sure. well okay gee fuck it now I gotta start over yeah. again and kind of get into it again but yeah, two minutes later you're gonna want to now do you know position number 14 in the Kama Sutra and it's like it's not you know as Cher Height said it can be a it could be a hot dog and a coke or it could be a five course meal it just depends <laughs> on what you want sure. at the time to make it be pleasurable for everybody, mm -hmm. right? But for everybody, not for, for him, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you know, how you work that out as a couple, how you recognize, because you know, then you're distal proximal interactive, but the interactive even becomes more and more synergistic, mm -hmm. right? As you get from kissing and touching and fondling to actually having sex. Mm -hmm. And there the synergies are driven by, you know, essentially brain mechanisms from the thalamus that are driving sort of, you know, synergistic neuronal activation. So you do something, you do, you do something back, person does something, you do something back, person does something, you do, and your bodies are both driving each other. And your brain synergies are driving each other mm -hmm. too. And they're driving each other to epileptiform activity, which is orgasm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so it's, you know, again, not something you need to have an orgasm. Some people can't, whatever, but that's part of the pleasure of it. Yeah. And then, then what? Well, now you're in this refractory period where you can hold each other. Mm -hmm. or, but, or if you've swiped right or left, now you're leaving. Sure. Right? So you're going to experience all that beautiful post-orgasmic bliss in your car yeah. while you're driving yeah. home. How lovely, okay? how romantic. How wonderful, how romantic is that, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, that may be what you want to do, but something's going to happen yeah. right? inevitably mm -hmm. to these hookups mm -hmm. where and it always does right where it's like ah oh, that was like amazing I just, the, the two of you just holding each other and then you fall asleep yeah all right you have this like, amazingly blissful sleep and now it's like 5 30 6 o'clock in the morning and you're like oh shit i i actually slept with this but i didn't just have sex with this but i actually mm -hmm. slept with this yeah. person yeah what do i say to her or him yeah. like now we're gonna have breakfast together oh, now you have to do the part you should have done right. at the beginning. Well, and, and it's interesting how people would say, well, I guess now we're in a relationship. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of people do sort of just go, that is what it is. Here yeah, we are. Yeah, here we are. What do we do now? You know, it's like I, I've been just having sex, but now it's like this yeah. other thing is happening. You know, and, and yeah, you get the release of oxytocin with orgasm. And part of that, that the spinal level is what disinhibits the actual climax, the actual mechanism of climax, but it also produces bonding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you're in that position, cuddling each other and have facial closeness and all this kind of thing, uh, you're gonna, that's one of Stendhal's principles from 1824, right? You're gonna bond, yeah? yeah? And one of his principles was if, you know, to the, to the woman who's, whose husband is having, you know, has a mistress, if the mistress looks like you, don't worry about it. You're the archetype. Mm. Yeah. Mm. The mistress doesn't look like you. You should be very afraid. Interesting. Because now he's, if he's having better sex with the mistress, the idea is that he could, he could lose his interest mm. in you because he now has a set of features. Well, that led us to like ask questions about feature detection. Like what, 
What about first experiences makes you get a type? Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a type. Whether it's interpersonal type or whether it's a physical type, yeah. people have a type. Why? How does mm -hmm. that even work? Yeah. You know, we say we're not monogamous, we're promiscuous, mm -hmm. but yet that's also in a balance, mm -hmm. right? Because you want to be able to predict, which is habit, which quite often is boring. Yeah, yeah. Right? So how do we, why do we go toward habit, yet we don't want that? We want something new. We well, can do something different with the same person, yeah. or you can do the same old, same old with a different person, who looks like the previous yeah. <laughs> yeah. person. Yeah. But she's different because she has a different name. Yeah. It's like, well, but you know, I think of Hugh Hefner. Yeah. That what was that TV show, The Girl Next Door, or whatever? Yeah. It was all something about like him and, and his like seven girlfriends, yeah. right? One of whom was brunette, and the other six were like. Blondes who looked exactly yeah. the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you go, wow, does Hef have a type? Clearly he does. Yeah. He likes something a little bit different interspersed in there, but it's a clear trend. It's a typically he yeah. clearly shows a pattern toward liking a particular type. We all have that, mm -hmm. one way or another. And I've even been, been able to induce this in rats, right? Uh, who are supposed to be the epitome of promiscuity. Really? Right? Oh yeah, they're, they're not, they're supposed to want you know, the Coolidge effect. You want, mm -hmm. you know, you sustain your ejaculations if you give a different partner every time mm -hmm. to a male. Well, you can defy that very easily if his first experiences are with a female that smells a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give him a choice between two females. One has the odor, one has a different odor or no odor. He'll ejaculate preferentially with the female with the odor, right? Which means he's, he's showing a mate choice. Yeah, he may play with the other one, for sure, but he's going to mate selectively with the familiar female. Mm -hmm. How often does the experience you do with rats translate to humans? Quite often. Quite often? Quite often. I, I kind of, not at first when I first got my own lab, but I, I've, I, ever since kind of becoming aware of sexual medicine and, and kind of the clinical questions that people are asking about sexuality, I've started asking those questions of rats and sure enough they respond like people. Mm -hmm. You have to, they, they do it their way. Right? Sure. They, I mean, yeah. they live in an olfactory world, not a visual world. So mm -hmm. if I give them a visual stimulus, I'm not going to go anywhere. But I give them an olfactory stimulus, that's, that works like a charm, yeah. right? And even, even to things that are kind of weird, okay? Mm -hmm. Like going into the realm of fetishes, right? Mm -hmm. Melrat has his first sexual experience is wearing a jacket, mm -hmm. like a little rodent tethering jacket, yeah? After a while, he can't have sex unless he has a jacket on. Which is kind of crazy. Yeah, it right? is. And yet it's not because from a Pavlovian account, the jacket is now imbued with sexual arousal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's only ever had the jacket on, right? If I take the jacket off, something's missing, mm. right? Yeah. Because it's become imbued, you know, cl through classical conditioning with the state of sexual arousal. Another example would be, okay, well, right, let's say I take the jacket on, not put it on him, but have his first sexual experiences with a female wearing a jacket. Mm -hmm. Okay, Does that work like the olfactory cue? Yeah. So now the jacket's on the other one, but that's synonymous with your sexual pleasure. And now you have a female without a jacket and a female with a jacket. Well, yeah, I can copulate with a female without the jacket, but my ejaculation is going to go with the female with the jacket. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so fetishes are somewhat... I guess they're somewhat arbitrary in some sense. It's just a matter of some type of exposure at the right moment of time to make that association in that case. Right? I think that's true. Although, I mean, there are people that would say, well, you know, there's also genetic differences between people who have paraphilias and those that don't, and brain differences between paraphilics and those that don't. Um, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? I mean, you could easily argue that those are not to create a fetish, because that has no reproductive value at all. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, I need to be wearing my furry costume in order to get my erection. Well, okay. So it does have a reproductive endpoint because if I don't have an erection because I'm not wearing my furry costume, I'm not going to reproduce at all. Mm -hmm. But there's nowhere in our in our, our our species history where we had to be furry, okay, <laughs> yeah, sure. or that we had to be necrophilic. Mm -hmm. That clearly has no reproductive mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. But what there is is just a brain that is that has the propensity for Pavlovian conditioning. So that gets at this notion that whatever's there first wins, mm. right? And if it happens to be the smell of leather in the backseat of the 57 Chevy, <laughs> well, guess what? 
some people may bond to that better than others, mm -hmm. right? If mm -hmm. you want to talk about diversity, the diversity is really in the ability to show this bonding. Mm -hmm. Some people are bonders. Some people are not bonders yeah. at all, right? Until they are. But they're generally, you know, there's this diversity between these. And, you know, every Valentine's Day, you look at the news, and what do they do? They put on this, you know, old couple that's been together for 70 years, and, the dude, you know, he's still looking at her like she's the 13-year-old girl he fell in love with. She's still looking at him like he's the 13-year-old boy that she fell in love with. And lo and behold, yeah, they're bonders, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Have they ever looked at other people? Of course they have. Right, but they probably looked selectively at people that looked like the. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Right, um, you know, if she say, you know, if she wants to do the pool boy, I bet you she's attracted to the pool a pool boy that looks like, the boy she had her first orgasms with, yeah, yeah. or whatever. Right, sure. so I think there's, I think. If that diversity exists within the central nervous system at a genetic level, and then capped by the epigenetics, if you will, yeah. of the experience mm -hmm. that activates these systems. I mean, we've been able to kind of boil it down to um, the way that opioids, which are mm -hmm. kind of the roots of pleasure, right? Not, not, everybody says, oh, well, dopamine's your reward system. No, dopamine is your attention to reward system, mm -hmm. right? That's just what drives you there. I see. Yeah? It's the opioids that cap the experience, that give you, like at orgasm, give you the ecstasy of orgasm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And... How does that work? Because opioids actually inhibit dopamine. Mm -hmm. But in the process of that inhibition, they also sensitize. I see. So the next time you're with a stimulus that's associated with the opioid reward, you now have turned up the gain on that volume. Yeah? Mm. It's now, so now you're more sensitive to that stimulus because it's associated with the reward. right? Mm -hmm. And the molecular mechanisms by which that occurs are known. Opioids do the same thing to oxytocin, mm -hmm. and those molecular mechanisms are known. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, to if you want to get to the root of that one, you've got dopamine carrying a conditional stimulus signal. Mm -hmm. Opioids reward that conditional stimulus signal. They're both impinging on oxytocin. One's driving oxytocin release. The opioids actually drive at a molecular level the creation of what's called a CD38 gene. Mm -hmm. That gene is critical. It's a essentially a calcium channel uh, uh, activator, and that gene allows calcium to come in, which then produces more oxytocin release. So the dopamine signal is triggering the oxytocin neuron to release however the hell much it has. Yeah. The opioid signal has sensitized this mechanism, right, that now allows more oxytocin release. So when you're in the presence of the partner, there's more oxytocin release. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's probably different for different people. It depends on the experience. It depends on the orgasm. It depends on when you have the orgasm. And you may think, you know, um, oh, well, you know, I know what orgasms are. You know, I have them very rarely, but I know what they are. And then you have a partner who, for whatever reason, knows your body well enough to stimulate it in you, like all the time. Or to drive you to have, you know, I thought I knew what a 10 was, yeah, but yeah. now I know with this partner that what I thought a 10 was is like really a 4, and now I'm having a real 10, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to change the way your brain interprets that individual. Yeah. And that individual now is your individual. So if that individual breaks synchrony, mm -hmm. becomes desynchronous, right, with you because they're kind of moving away from you, you know, they're going to get jealous yeah. and grab onto that person and feel depressed when that person leaves. Mm -hmm. Because that's how that system works, yeah. yeah? Let me ask you sort of a, a, taking a step back a little bit, with your sort of hyper understanding of the neurochemical mechanisms and looking at it from a molecular perspective, do you feel that takes away from your ability to like, personally appreciate No, it? not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. I know, I get that question all the time. No, it doesn't take away at all. In fact, it, it's, it's kind of magic. Yeah. It's still alchemy in my mind because sure. like, okay, I know what these pro... That opioid thing made that orgasm make me go, oh, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like the conscious experience of that, like that's amazing. Yeah, no, it is. You know, I'm, I'm not going to like invoke God in this or anything, but that conscious experience, the fact that that happens and makes you feel that way, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, and uh, yeah, it makes sense that that which is most rewarding is also going to be most reproductively salient. Sure. How the hell else would you know? I mean, animals don't read the book. Yeah, exactly. Right? They don't know, oh, if I do this, then that'll happen, and then that's going to be... They don't read the book. They just know what's pleasurable and what isn't. Yeah. And they try to do 
to maximize their pleasure, just like we do. Yeah. And we can write books about it, but... It's really the only difference. You know, the poetry gets closer to it. The music gets closer to it, right? Because it's an experience. It's a whole experience. Yeah. yeah. So there's no... Yeah, it's still pretty magic in my head. Yeah. And then going back to the, the topic of fetishes, one thing that's interesting is because of, you know, outlining how it works, the fact that there are such, you know, take foot fetishes, for example, that's a very common one. Mm -hmm. You would think you would very rarely have an overlap between fetishes just because if you have this sort of very particular stimulus and association at a particular point in time, yeah, there's a lot of people who like something like feet. So mm -hmm. it seems almost to conflict with that idea. Do you think so? or? Well, and yet, interestingly, if you think of the homunculus, the sensory homunculus, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the representation of your sensory systems on your premotor yeah. cortex. Um, well, golly gosh, guess what? The feet are really close to the genitals, physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. And the general representation is the same for men and women. Um, there's a lot of overlap in women. You know, you think of how the how the I mean, the clitoris is mostly an internal structure, with the glands being external. But I mean, people look at glands, clitoris versus vagina versus cervix, and it's a, the overlap is incredible, mm -hmm. right? But the, ear, the inner folds of the ear are overlapping with that, the nipples are overlapping with that, mm. the feet are overlapping I with see. that, okay? Work that Barry Commissaric has done in, in, in Rutgers, New Jersey. And in men, it's the same, right? I mean, the foot's not like somewhere else. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it, that somatotopic representation is, is there. Mm -hmm. And Pavlov actually showed that things that are closer literally closer to, for example, where a buzzer might be represented in auditory cortex. Mm -hmm. Things that are closer physically to that are, are more likely to get associated with that as a second order stimulus to generate salivation I in the see. dog, right? So that things that are not so close can still get associated, but it just takes a longer time mm -hmm. to make that association happen, yeah? yeah? And so it's just a matter of the physical structure of your brain. Mm -hmm. And things that are closer are more likely to be associated, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's, it's hard to get your elbow yeah, associated yeah, with see. it, you know? I'm it's sure, like, but I'm sure. well, uh, I'm, but there's probably yeah, somebody, surely, surely. you know, who always had his elbow touched, yeah. right? Whereas other, you know, your face is closer to it. Yeah. Your lips are closer to mm -hmm. it. Your nipples are closer to it. And they're all erectile, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you're getting sexually aroused, you're activating blood flow to these smooth muscles, mm -hmm. well, guess what? It's much more likely to be associated. Another uh, somewhat different question is, uh, I fear, when, again, another, another topic that kept coming up having conversations with friends leading up to this, is they just sort of di don't give the whole discipline the respect I, we both obviously feel that it deserves. And I'm sure that there will be some people watching this who may have, may have found the podcast from in astrophysics or chemistry or whatever. I mean, not that we aren't talking about chemistry, but who might dismiss it or, or put it on a different shelf than they would something like those topics. Do you find that a lot? Do you find people just not giving it the time of day as if it's sure. some, as something strange or... Sure. I'm, I mean, you know, people, I think, in general are really interested in sex. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sex sells. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Granting agencies, on the other hand, yeah, sure. you know, if there's a pandemic, well, we can do the sex research can take yeah. a backseat yeah. to this because, mm -hmm. and yet, one of the things that gives us such meaning in our lives is our sex lives mm -hmm. and being, you know, fluent in our sexuality and being un and understanding it and knowing how to treat it when there's a problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you don't, your quality of life goes down dramatically. Yeah, yeah? so. I think, but I, but I think because it's still, we still have this holdover culturally of it being a prurient interest and it being something that's base and, you know, we don't talk about it and we yeah. don't have to, yeah, so the science of sex, sexology, um, is something that people, I think it, it, it's easy for people to dismiss it or to say, oh, well, that's not real science, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, if somebody asks me, what are you? You know, if I go through customs and immigration, so I say, oh, what's, what do you do? I say I'm a prof professor of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. I don't say I'm a sexologist, yeah. okay? And I don't do that because I know if I say I'm a sexologist, the, you know, that's going to erupt some questions. Yeah. You know, oh, what are you doing here? 
Yeah. You know, are you are you are you Sexology. here? To, you know, are you are you a, are you a pimp? Are you a yeah, this? Yeah. Are you you know are you doing something else that mm -hmm. I think is shady? Yeah. Um, but I am a neuroscientist, yeah, yeah. so obviously I'm studying sexual response from that level of, at that level of analysis, and mm -hmm. I know some other shit other than sex. But sure. it's like, you know, if if you say you're a sexologist, what does that mean? Yeah. Right. Does that mean you're a clinical? sexologist are you a social sexologist are you a neural sexologist like it, like there's no good name for that right yeah. um so yeah you're i do sexual neuroscience right and, and if they ask well what do you study i'll tell them yeah sure. and, some, and sometimes they give them way too much information so they go oh, okay sure. Sure. off you go <laughs> you know yeah um but i do think people dismiss it i think there's a lot of cognitive components of sex that people dismiss Mm -hmm. as if it's supposed to be just there, right? Yeah. So how you think about it, what you do, what you do to prepare for it, what you, what you learn about somebody else, yeah? I mean, how do you know another person's body? You don't. Mm -hmm. You don't. And I mean, uh, you know, I always think, oh, well, maybe gay people have it better because they understand, they at least have the same appendages, right? <laughs> yeah. They're the same, familiarity. the same, you know, anatomy and physiology, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, it, it becomes complex when you don't have the same thing and you think that your pleasure is also there. You know, if you're getting pleasure from what you're doing, well, the other person must be too. Mm -hmm. But, of course, yeah. that isn't necessarily true, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, in fact, in most cases, it isn't. And mm -hmm. so what you're doing may not equate with the other person's pleasure. So you're going to learn about that other person, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think anybody in a committed, you know, intimate relationship needs to like put their own you know they need to they, they, need, to, they need to put their own pleasure on hold sometimes yeah. and really understand the other person's landscape like the other person's pleasure system mm -hmm. how does that work yeah. what works for this other person you can ask but the other person may not know yeah you know so you got this discovery going on and that can be eroticized quite dramatically yeah. you know just like going to a new restaurant like oh i never ate ethiopia before <laughs> you know well, let's go what is yeah. it about oh i eat with our hands and the bread and the, oh, yeah. and the flavors are different and so you can like both discover that mm -hmm. oh we don't have a problem with that you know yeah. yeah well why don't we do the same thing with sex like why not make that something that we you know we get creative with or we become you know we learn about each other Right, mm -hmm. and that can that can be quite interesting, you know, like just not having, you know, sex every Friday night in a bedroom at yeah. eleven thirty, <laughs> but having it in the daytime in the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, it's like how do you have sex in the kitchen? Well, it's okay, it's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah. You get a chair, <laughs> start with a chair, yeah. right? Start with somebody bend over a stove. I don't yeah. know. There's like a million figure ways yeah. that you can figure out that you can be creative with that, mm -hmm. right? And then be creative outside. Be yeah. creative at the beach. Be yeah. creative. Wherever the hell it is, you sure. know. So I think there's a cognition to that, and a mm -hmm. cognition around pleasure. And part of the problem with sex is that it is so pleasurable. But one of the things we never talk about is pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people, you know, people will talk about the restaurant, but do they talk about the pleasure? You know, the food gave me like you know a tongue gasm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do they really talk about it that way? No. They'll even even you know the restaurant critic will say, oh well, you know, you know the the taste of this was exquisite. Yeah. Okay. Okay, exquisite. Uh, Still sort of indirect. Okay. It's indirect. Yeah. yeah. And even clinical sexologists and clinical sex therapists, they generally you know if you come with a problem like sexual desire disorder. And that kind of is diminishing your orgasm, too, or if you have one at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now your desire's back. So, yeah. off you go, yeah. right? But no, it's what about pleasure? First step. <laughs> you know, and if, if you've got pleasure, your desire will be there, yeah. right? It'll bring desire along with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, how does that work, mm -hmm. you know? And, and why do we not talk about pleasure? It's something that makes us smile and blush and yeah. all this kind of jump and orgasm. Yeah. Oh, what was <laughs> yeah. it like? Yeah, what was yeah. it like? How'd you rate it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and how do we know what that is? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's one, again, another reason I wanted to have this conversation with you is I think, I hope a few people watching will sort of be, not shocked, but I want to, to take the people who might be uncomfortable with listening to this topic mm -hmm. at, at, from any angle, whether it's a more strictly academic angle to right. something more informal, and I think we're doing a, a little bit of both, and just make it, it's just a normalization thing. 
because I think nobody can get to the conceptualization and the cognitive development part of things until they can at least just sit yeah. there and bear to think or watch others think and engage on the topic because it's not there's nothing mystical mm -hmm. there's nothing unique about it than anything else and the sooner that we get there the sooner the incels go away the sooner that we all have happier healthier lives and we never talk about sex like yeah, this yeah, exactly right? we never talk openly about it it's hard I, I i really do recognize that and i know that it makes people uncomfortable i remember one time i i, I had a grad student who was doing the first studies on clitoral stimulation of female rats. I mean, we had no idea. She got a paintbrush, a <laughs> natural fiber paintbrush, and she was kind of mimicking the way a male's pelvis will hit the clitoris as he's mounting her. And female rats loved it. I mean, they wiggled their ears, they came back. We had, we had this one, her name was uh, Mae Parada, we had this one, uh, she was wearing a lab coat, and they were filming it, mm -hmm. right? And she'd done the clitoral stimulation, the female was like loving it. And as Mae was pulling her arm out, the rat came up with it, with its teeth, grabbed her arm, grabbed her <laughs> jacket, and pulled her arm back in. I mean, there's no question. Yeah. And when, I, when I've been at meetings and I show that video, and I say, seems like female rats really likes have it, like having their clitoris stimulated. It's like everybody laughs, yeah. but it's clear. So May and I were on the bus one yeah. time, and we were talking about like the next experiment. Oh God! Right? <laughs> yeah, sure. And we're just talking about it, like mm -hmm. you know, like okay, like you might talk about, oh, we're going to eat tonight. You know, we're talking about the next experiment, and people around us are like looking at each other and kind of looking at us, like, oh, how could you talk about, you know, clit stim, mm -hmm. right? In this, I mean, oh, you yeah, know, how I know. awful. And I mean, we're talking about the 21st century. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if people get upset on a bus that you're talking about clitoral stimulation, how, how do we talk about it? Yeah, exactly. you know? And that's a problem with couples because they don't have a language yeah. to talk about sex with each other. Yeah. You know? It's like she said, oh, well, you know, I'll fake it because I don't want him to feel bad. But, that's not getting anyone But anymore. that's not getting anywhere. That's not yeah. doing anything. And that's not doing anybody any good. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, you know, I don't want him to feel bad. I don't want her to feel bad. I don't want to say, oh, I like it, you know, I'd rather you do me like this, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a way to say that, yeah. yeah? You can say, I really like it when you do this, yeah. right? And that will be enough of an impetus to make the other person do it. So why is that such a big deal? Yeah. Yet it is a big deal mm -hmm. because we don't, you know, parents don't talk with us about sex and if they do, it's very rudimentary. The sex ed we get, I mean, in some parts of the United States, it's abstinence yeah. only. Mm -hmm. In other parts, it's, you know, STI-based. So if you do this, you will die. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, <laughs> you know, or you'll get a disease yeah. forever. Yeah. Herpes forever. Yeah. Yeah, that, that can happen. Yeah. And there are ways to protect yourself. But when does anybody ever get maximal pleasure? Yeah. Right? When do we talk about trying to, you know... I mean, if I wanted to be an Olympic athlete, you know, I, there's a way, starting with my proclivity when I'm young, because I really play good, you know, soccer, or really play good hockey, or really, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm very accurate with an arrow, you know, so there's a way to progress me through training mm -hmm. that will give me the 10,000 hours I need to be an Olympic athlete. Yeah. When do we do that with sex? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's simple as we don't. And again, exactly. I got, uh, in my own experience, we had, I, w I would assume, a more substantial sex ed program than probably most the rest of the United States at least gets. Mm -hmm. And even then it was just trivial. And they also don't mm -hmm. factor in, like at the end of the day, a room of, you know, 100 eighth grade boys. You can't just have people throw in anonymous questions and then get up there and pick them out. Because everyone's just going to take the piss and just write goofy shit. And exactly. you can't be honest with yourselves as an eighth grader sitting there with your friends. I mean, just the format needs to change. Yep. The, the frequency needs to change. The subject matter, all of these different things. Well, in countries like Finland, they actually start sex ed in grade one. Really? Mm -hmm. Just by sort of the anatomy. the anatomy. Where do babies come yeah. from? That's a big question. Great, yeah. you know, people in grade one want to know. Hell, people that are three years old want to know where yeah. the baby came from. Well, then where did I come? I came from the same thing. Yeah. I came the same way, mm -hmm. you know? And instead of it, you know, being the stork, you know, you can yeah. say daddy put his penis inside mommy's vagina. <laughs> sure. And daddy ejaculated a Yeah, it doesn't a sperm. need to be the sex, it, like, I mean, it, I mean, sexual it doesn't have yes, to be, but. Yeah, and you can say that to a grade one -er. Yeah. And they will get it. Mm -hmm. They won't really understand it. They're not supposed to. But they're not ready to understand yeah. it at that level that you would understand it when you're in grade 8. Yeah. Or when you're 18, right? 
but they'll understand that this is something that isn't imbued with secrecy. Mm -hmm. It's something out in the open. It's something people do. They love it. You don't even have to put love into it. Daddy and mommy felt really, it felt really good to make you, yeah, right? Sure. And we weren't intending on making you, but guess what? It happened. Yeah. And now you're here and we love you. Yeah. And it's so wonderful. And we have a family and blah, blah, blah. It's like there's a way to do this to make the anatomy and the physiology understandable. Mm -hmm. Now I did this to my kid. And I remember he talked about it, bec not because it was a thing. His daycare teacher, he was, I think he was four, mm -hmm. his daycare teacher was going on maternity leave. And so one of the, the head of the daycare said, you know, well, Tasha's going because she has a baby in her tummy. And my son, Josh, said, no, no. And they, they described this to me, no. And of course, daycare teachers, they were like, oh, He's got separation anxiety. Mm. You know, he loves Tasha and Tasha's leaving. And so he must have, so they took him aside. It's okay. And, so, and Josh was like, no, 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 no. Babies don't go in your tummy. Food goes in your tummy. <laughs> Babies grow in a uterus. Okay. Now he knew the oh, words, wow. oh, right? Wow. Yeah. And of course yeah. he did, because I taught him. Because yeah. I'm yeah. a sex researcher. What the hell else am I going <laughs> to yeah, teach my sorry. kid, right? I, I, I arrived to pick him up. Dicker, the head says, wait, wait, we want to work with you. Now, all women, right? And I go in and they're like, you know, first thing, why does Joshua know what a uterus is? I thought, that's a really strange question. Yeah. You should be happy he knows what a uterus yeah. is, right? And I, so I said, well, he, he knows what all the body parts are. Why does he know that? And I said, well, because he asked. Well, how did he ask? I'm like, what? What do you mean, how do you Do you guys think there's like a family problem here? Yeah, like, what yeah. do you think is going on here? I don't know. You know, the, the question was so weird to me. Like, why would he ask? He's four years old. He wanted to know where babies came from. Yeah. yeah? So it's like, why? Well, I, I explained that. And, <laughs> and the, uh, one of the other daycare teachers says, well, does he know all the words? I said, to all the parts? Yeah. Like, does he know what a clitoris is? Yeah. Yes. Does he know what ovaries are? Mm -hmm. Yes. Does he know that they come through a fallopian tube? Yes. <laughs> Does he know that if he was female, his testicles would have actually been his ovaries? Yes. Does he understand that his, his mm -hmm. masculinization was a process and he would have been female had he not been? Yes. Mm -hmm. The look of horror on their face was palpable. Right? And all I could imagine was, what are they afraid of? Are they yeah. afraid that he's going to use the word clitoris on the playground? <laughs> Johnny's a clitoris, yeah. right? Okay, like, so what if he does? Like, Johnny's a big toe. I mean, what, what, <laughs> yeah, exactly. what the hell's the difference, yeah, right? Yeah. Except that if some kid goes home and says clitoris, and the parents are like, ah, you said clitoris. It's like, where did you learn that word? Yeah. I learned it from Joshua at daycare. Oh, and they call the yeah. daycare, and now the daycare has to deal with it. I was just thinking, Jesus Christ, really? Yeah. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier, where it's like, what, what is the fear? Especially at that age, I would argue it's probably especially great because they don't have, they're pre-sexual, I suppose, in some sense. They're not, they don't hear clitoris and really get it in the way that, again, an eighth grader, a high schooler, et cetera, yeah. would understand. It's purely anatomy. It's abstracted from the part that they are presumably concerned yeah. with. Yeah. It's just a fact. Well, well it's, it's interesting because one of the daycare kids, when he was now, I think, because... It's kind of the same cohort of them went mm -hmm. to the same school, same elementary school. When they were in grade four, one of the kids who was in his daycare said, well, how come girls don't pee through their clitoris? I said, that's a really good question, yeah. you know, because their urethra is right under their clit. And he goes, but why did ours get put into our, into our penis? And I'm like, well, the why is, I mean, I can tell you the process by which that happens, the why, yeah. I don't know, maybe, you know, Mother Nature's got a sense of humor, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the why is unknown, yeah. right? But, you know, he says, but, but then girls, girls can't stand up and pee. I said, well, they can, but they can't aim it the way we can because their clitoris came outside, right? Mm -hmm. But most of their clitoris is inside, so, yeah, they can't, like, write their name in the snow, <laughs> yeah, right? Sure. Um, and he thought, oh, well, that's... Hmm. He kind of thought about that, and I thought, "Fuck, that's great!" Yeah. Right? Because yeah. here's a kid who's going to understand that. Okay, there's a bit of a difference, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and how that difference came about. 
Yeah. And, and that's, you know, you want to be clitorate. That's, <laughs> that's part of clitoracy is to understand that, yeah. you know, that this is a little bit different, you yeah. know, and, and, and then that hopefully might make him, when he gets older and becomes sexual, want to know where, where the rest of that clitoris is, yeah. Yeah. you know? Just be well more, better adapted in general, yeah, yeah after thinking yeah. at that point. Okay, well, again, this, I, I re- let this go longer than oh, I wanted. Okay. I don't want to take too That's much okay. of your time. Okay. Okay. So really, thank you so much. Oh, again, no hopefully, problem. I would love again in the future, whether, I mean, I'll, I'll find my way back in Prague soon yeah, enough. Yeah, sure. And then online, I'd love to continue this. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the response because, again, I think it's super important. I think it's super interesting. And I think people don't even understand that there is, it is taken this seriously. It's a, it's a meaningful, serious, rigorous scientific discipline that deserves the respect, the funding. And, the, and it's still evolving. Yeah, exactly. It's still evolving. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not... You know, the last frontier, yeah, but sure. it's it's one of the last frontiers, yeah, really, because yeah. it's still, we, still there's still so much we new. don't know. Yeah. There's still so much we don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, I'm going to die before all my questions are answered. In any discipline, Damn we all it. suffer the, the same curse. We suppose that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, again, thank you so much. Thanks. Really appreciate Thanks for having me.